I already got the questions of, well, how do we install these forwarding entries into the Open vSwitches? We'll walk through that step by step. We'll start with NSX for multiple hypervisors, which, as I said before, uses OpenFlow. In the beginning, let's assume that we already have one tunnel established between two hypervisors, and we have VMA and VMB running on these two hypervisors. I do have to mention that although we are talking about tunnels, these are just logical constructs within the OpenV switch. So they're not even Linux interfaces. It's just something that we have to do because OpenFlow wants to have point-to-point -point interfaces. So we pretend within the OpenV switch there is a tunnel. Next, the user asks the cloud management platform to start a new VM, and the new VM is placed on host C and started. Now, the new VM obviously needs connectivity to the other two VMs. So the first thing that happens is that the cloud management platform has to tell the NSX controller through the API that we need this new virtual machine on host C, and it has to be added to the rest of the layer 2 subnet in this case. The first thing that happens is OVSDB pushes out information that we need a new tunnel in double quotes. And these two tunnels are created on all three hosts. And now that we have the new logical interfaces, we can push OpenFlow entries from the OpenFlow controller to all three hypervisors. And the entries would be something simple like on host A, if the destination address is max C, then use the a to C tunnel, and so on, and so on, and so on. Now, the new VM has started, and you know that the first thing it will do is it will send out ARP requests. There are two ways we can handle flooding. The first one is we can do flooding in the source hypervisor. So the source hypervisor would create multiple copies of the flooded packet and send it over multiple tunnels. This is good enough for most environments that are not flooding intensive. And in this case, what would happen is that, for example, in host C, you would get two entries saying, if the destination equals multicast, send the packet here and here. So when the VM would send an ARP request, the packet would be sent over this tunnel and over this tunnel. It would eventually hit both VMs, and one of them would respond with a unicast. ARP reply. You see that even though we are doing flooding, there is no dynamic learning involved here. For high volume environments, it's recommended to use service nodes, and the whole idea is that you offload the flooding to the service nodes. So, what happens is when the new host is added to the logical network, a new tunnel from the service node to the host is created. So there is a tunnel from the service node to every host in the logical network, and the OpenFlow entries look something like this. On host A, for example, if the destination equals multicast, send it over the tunnel to the service node. On the service nodes, the rules are even simpler. If it came from A, send it to B and C, for example. So a single packet is sent to the service node, the service node performs replication. And this is obviously a better option for high volume environments. An immediate question, a very relevant one, is the service node an appliance? Yes, today it has to be an appliance. Brad, are there any plans to turn service nodes into VMs? I'm not aware of any plans to do that, Ivan. Next one, what determines the switching point between head end replication and service node replication? You configure it manually. By the way, the only thing you have to configure is the replication type, so whether you want to do it through service node or on the source node, and you have to configure the number of the service nodes that are in the system, and the controller automatically handles allocation and association of logical networks with different service nodes. It seems that we really have some good old networking engineers on the call because I see like three comments saying, Good to see ATM LAN emulation leaves again. 
and you're totally right, there is nothing new on the world. Can you have redundant service nodes? Yes. What happens in a service node failure? The NSX controller discovers that the service node has failed and reconfigures the OpenFlow entries. How many nodes or hypervisors can NSX support? The last published numbers I've seen have been 5,000 hypervisors with five NSX controllers. Brad, do we have anything newer? I think that is the most current information I've seen as well. Is it possible that a customer may not buy multicast service node and still to work with NSX only? The service nodes and the gateways are just software images that are deployed on regular x86 server hardware. So you don't have to buy a service node. You deploy service node image on a dedicated server, so you don't have to buy it. How would Layer 2 multicast inside a VXLAN segment work with unicast implementation of VXLAN in the transport network? So the source node would have to replicate all Layer 2 flooded packets, so all multicast packets in your case, and send them to all other hypervisors that participate in the Layer 2 segment. That's the best we can do today. Are tunnels running a keep alive protocol? So do we see that the other end is down? Yes, absolutely. So just like the layer two gateways you explained earlier, Ivan, are using CFM to detect liveliness, the tunnels are doing the same thing. So a hypervisor will know if there's uh, you know, connectivity issues in the tunnel. To find other virtual networking, data center, and cloud networking webinars, visit ipspace.net.